and amen. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 3, and I want you to hold your place there. I promise I will meet you there in just a moment. Today, I want to walk you through, continue walking you through some of the life verses that have formed and shaped my own personal spiritual journey. I've been doing that for the last few weeks. And if you were here last week, uh, this week's conversation is going to be whiplash compared to last week's. It's a totally different perspective on faith. Last week, I walked you through a pattern that is revealed in Scripture, both Old and New Testament, especially in the ministry of Jesus, where we see before God ever performs a miracle, he often asks for an act of irrational obedience on the end of the person or the people in need. It's there over and over again in the Bible. It's undeniable, unmistakable, a pattern that points to irrational obedience to God as a radical expression of faith, the kind of faith to which God responds miraculously. And we looked at these last week. But for example, John 5, Jesus tells the lame man, take up your mat and walk. In John 9, he tells the blind man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. In Mark 3, he tells the man with the withered hand to stretch out his hand. In Luke 17, he tells the 10 lepers to go show themselves to the priest. And in John 11, at the tomb of Lazarus, he tells the grieving onlookers to take away or move the stone. In every one of these instances, the miracles happened on the other side of obedience. For example, Mary and Martha and the people gathered at Lazarus' tomb couldn't raise the dead, but they could move a rock. And when they obeyed and did the natural thing, Jesus did the supernatural thing. No other miracle of Jesus probably makes this any more clear than the healing of the 10 lepers in Luke 17. They come to him asking for healing, and Jesus tells them, go show yourself to the priest. He didn't need the priest's help. He simply wanted to know if these men had enough faith to obey, and they would express their faith through obedience. And it's made obvious what Jesus was searching for when he gave them that command, when you pay attention to when the miracle happens. In Luke 17, verse 14, he looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy, literally as they turned to go, showing their intent, expressing their faith through obedience. It is in that moment the miracle happened. This pattern of command obedience, miracle occurs over and over again in the Bible. Because what we said last week, your irrational obedience to God's commands is one of the deepest expressions of your faith and trust in him. But let me ask you a question. And this is where we're going to camp out the rest of our time today. What if you've done that? What if you've obeyed? What if you've been faithful? What if you've done everything right and still nothing happens? Your prayers are still not answered, there's no healing, there's no breakthrough, the miracle doesn't come. For the rest of our time today, I want us to look at faith from another perspective, a totally different way to think about faith. And in order to do that, I want to point you to another one of my life verses. And let me give you some context to what we're about to see in Daniel 3. The Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, has created a statue out of gold turned it into a God, and he has made a decree that all the people in his kingdom are supposed to bow down before this idol that he's created. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are young Hebrew men that had been taken as slaves when Nebuchadnezzar ransacked Jerusalem and marched the people into Babylonian captivity. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are a part of that captivity. They serve God, not idols. And, yet, and because of that, they refuse to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Nebuchadnezzar is furious. I mean, picture this throng of people in the courtyard of Babylon, this massive statue, thousands of people on their face before this God, and three young Hebrew men standing there refusing to bow. Nebuchadnezzar goes into a rage, and in the public square, before all the people, he gives the Hebrew boys one more chance to bow, and he warns them, that if they do not respond and respect him or his God, they will be thrown into a blazing furnace. And he actually tells his men to stoke the fire and get it hotter. I want you to see how these young men responded to this powerful and wicked king. 
Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you set up. I want you to key in on that phrase, the first part of verse 18, it has become one of the guiding principles of my life, but even if he doesn't. Those young men were saying to the king, our God is able to deliver us, but even in his sovereignty, if he were to choose something else, something other than what we want him to do, we're serving notice on you, king. We're still going to trust God. We're still going to be faithful to him. We're still going to honor him, and we we will not bow. We refuse to bow to your idol. I want you to let that phrase get in your spirit today, but even if he doesn't, because there's an incredible amount of trust and faith in that expression. There is this real unmistakable tension in the Bible between what I preached last week And what I'm preaching to you this week, both of them are there. And there's a tension between the two. There is this obvious pattern of radical, um, uh, irrational request, a command, and then irrational obedience setting miracles in motion. It's there. But there's also, at the same time, several instances in the Bible where people were full of faith. They were obedient. They did everything right. And God still did not respond the way they wanted him to. This is what I call, but even if he doesn't, faith. It's faith that says, God is able to deliver me. He's able to heal me. He's able to provide for me. But even if he doesn't, I will still trust him. I will still serve him. I will still worship him. And I will still honor him because I'm not serving him for what he does for me, but who he is to me. It's not about his hand, it's about his face, who he is, not what he does. I grew up in a theological framework that believed God answers prayer. We prayed for the sick. We believed that God could move mountains. We had faith for the miraculous. And today, I believe those things more than any other time in my life. And North Place is one of those churches, one of those churches that believes What you read on the pages of the book of Acts wasn't just for some specific part of history or dispensation, that God is the same today as he was in the book of Acts, and we believe he's as supernaturally active in our world today as he was in the book of Acts, and we believe that faith still moves the heart of God. But let me warn you, when you embrace a theology of power that believes in the supernatural, When you believe that God responds to the prayer of faith, it's easy to get consumed and swept away and only celebrate one perspective of faith. We hear a testimony of answered prayer, somebody sick gets healed, or we hear that somebody far from God gets saved, or an addict gets delivered, or we hear this story of miraculous financial provision, and we celebrate the faith associated with those miracles. That kind of faith draws crowds, it fills churches, it sells books, and it makes preachers popular. Faith for the miraculous is marketable. It sells on Christian television and packs arenas. But there's another side of faith referenced in the Bible. I call it the flip side of faith. It's the underbelly of faith. It's not pretty, it's not marketable, and it doesn't pack arenas but it's still a faith that captures the heart of God. But even if he doesn't faith, is the faith that will help you keep your wits when it seems like the heavens are brass and God isn't coming through. It's the kind of faith that will fuel your perseverance when the miracle doesn't come. Look with me to Hebrews chapter 11, and the writer of Hebrews here is gonna address both perspectives of faith, what I preached about last week and What I'm telling you about right now, he addresses faith that sees the miraculous and faith that endures in the face of hardship and suffering. The entire chapter of Hebrews 11 is about faith. 
It starts with a definition of faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then it moves from that into what is often called the roll call of the heroes of faith. The first 35 verses of Hebrews chapter 11, the writer names people and their great exploits by faith. He talks about Abraham and Enoch and Moses and Rahab, and he describes faith for the miraculous. All these incredible things that happen because of all of these people's faith. I mean, he talks about faith that moves mountains, and God responds with miracles. He describes the faith that parted the Red Sea, the faith that caused the walls of Jericho to fall flat. And then you get to verse 32. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms. They ruled with justice and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. People were literally raised from the dead by faith. Now that's the kind of faith that will pack an arena and draw a crowd. And to be honest, if we're all honest, that's that's where we want our story. We want our story recorded in the first 35 verses of the book of Hebrews, uh, the, the first 35 verses of Hebrews 11. We want to see that kind of miracle. We want God to work supernaturally on our behalf. But the middle of verse 35 changes everything. Women receive their dead, raised back to life again. That's 35A. When you start reading in 35B, you see the flip side of everything. If we could choose, we want 35A or before. But for some reason, some of us are called to live, verse 35b and on. And this is where it gets ugly. This is where people are forced to live with a but even if he doesn't kind of faith. Here's what it says, verse 35b. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to get free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at. And their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. And others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground, all by faith, because of their faith. Remember, this entire chapter is in a chapter about people with incredible faith. And there is as much or more faith expressed by the people from 35B on as in the earlier verses of the chapter. Sometimes our faith sees the miracle and sometimes the deepest expression of our faith is trusting God when the miracle and deliverance never come. The writer of Hebrews says in the very next verse, all these people, the people in the first 35 verses that saw the miracles and the people in the latter verses that lived through the suffering, all these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. The same faith that led some to victory led others into suffering, their death, martyrdom, and yet the heart of God was moved by all of their faith. Some people will tell you, That if you have enough faith that God will give you everything you need or everything you want every single time. And if for some reason he doesn't, you must not have enough faith. My mentor, some of my mentors are up in years now, but they pastored a church when they were younger, went on to become the president of the seminary where I studied. When they were pastoring a church, they had an 11 year old daughter that died with leukemia. Some super spiritual people in their church had the audacity to tell them that if they would have had enough faith, their daughter would not have died. That kind of heretical theology is fueled by people that have turned God into a genie. They have made him their cosmic bellhop, and they think they can order him around in the name of faith. But just think about it for a moment. If God did everything you told him, when you told him, the way you told him, you would be God, not him. Too many people have lost respect for the sovereignty of God. 
He's not your slot machine. He's not your Santa Claus. He's not just a gift giver doling out gifts. He is holy. He is righteous. He is just. And he is in control. And we've forgotten that God answers every prayer we pray. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. And sometimes he says wait. And we have to trust his judgment even when the answers don't align with our wants or our timing. In saying no, he may be maturing us. In saying wait, he may be expanding his kingdom in ways that we have no power or perspective to see or understand. The real question is, do you have the faith to trust him when God does not respond the way you want him to? And this kind of trust, when life and God doesn't make sense, is the flip side of faith. It's the but even if he doesn't kind of faith. Most people serve God. They probably wouldn't say this, but if you get down in the depths of their motives, they really serve God because of what they think God's going to do for them. They come to him because of what he's promised to dole out and they never fall in love with who he is. They never, it's not about his character. It's all about his actions. But let me say it this way. It's not what God does that makes him who he is. It's who he is that allows him to do what he does. His acts or actions flow from his character. Do you know what that means? That means if God never performed another miracle, he'd still be God. If he never answered another single prayer you prayed, he would still be God. He doesn't have to do another thing to prove himself. It's not what he does that proves who he is. It's who he is that empowers him to do what he does. And the flip side of faith is the faith that will keep you trusting him when your circumstances call on you to turn your back. The flip side of faith is the kind of faith that will keep you trusting him When he says no, or his silence makes you feel like he has chosen not to act the way you want him to. Uh, But even if he doesn't, faith is the kind of faith that Job expressed when his life had fallen apart. Lost his health, lost his kids, lost all of his financial resources, and his own wife looked at him and said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job replied, though he slay me. Yet will I trust in him. I saw both perspectives of faith unfold right in front of me many, many years back. Haley and I had just gotten married, gone into the ministry. We've been married almost 30 years now. So this has been right after that. It's been almost 30 years ago. And it was as if God gave me this gift of allowing me to see two events, two completely different perspectives of faith, right side by side, as if he juxtaposed them so I could compare them and see the essence of what real faith is. The first of those events, I was a 19-year-old, newly married evangelist, and I was preaching a revival outside of Chicago. It was one of my first trips up north. It was one of the larger churches I had preached in, a little town of Clinton, Illinois, south of Chicago. The church had a great reputation. A long-term statesman pastor, Bill Bell, is now in heaven invited me to pray. He took a risk. He knew me through someone else and opened his pulpit to me. I was supposed to start the revival Sunday morning and preach through Wednesday evening. Um, And I had dinner with Bill and his wife that night. Haley and I did. And I had a baby face at the time. And I think Bill started second guessing his uh, willingness to let this 19 year old kid in his large church pulpit on a Sunday morning. Um, And so he said at dinner that night, he said, Brian, you know what? I'm feeling led to preach in the morning and uh, will you start the revival tomorrow night? I'm like, okay. And I sensed there was this consternation and he's he's like, what have I done? What have I got myself into? So Bill, Pastor Bell preached that morning and then Sunday night rolled around. I preached the message um, and, and we had a time of prayer at the end. I went back, all the pastors were seated. Pastor Bell, a senior at that time, old enough to be our grandpa at that moment, was getting up to conclude the service. This guy just met me. He's just getting to know me. I'm sitting in the seat and I had this unction, this, this inclination in my heart that God's not finished, that there were people in the room that were in desperate need. I'm not talking about just everybody has a need. I'm talking about a desperate need with the time clock. And if God doesn't show up, disaster is looming. And, um, and so I didn't know what to do. This was one of those irrational requests. And so I go to Pastor Bell while he's talking I get his ear and I say to him, you got to realize he doesn't know me. I don't know him. I'm like, I just sense in my heart, 
we need to call some people forward for prayer that are in desperate need. And he could have said no and sent me to my seat, but Pastor Bell handed me the mic and I said, I just sense before we go, we have to do this. And, 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 if, and, and I told him, if you're in this desperate situation, so 12 people, uh, 12 or 13 people responded and we went back into a time of worship and prayer. I, I went and prayed briefly with each person there and Haley prayed with some of them and there were a prayer team praying with all of them. And there was a lady that caught my attention when she came down the aisle, she had obviously been crippled from a stroke. Um, she, her right hand was withered across her body, her right jaw hung, and she drug her right leg behind her as she came to the front of the building. I prayed with her. I prayed that God would heal her. Uh, nothing happened at that moment. I went on down. I got to the end. When I got to the very last person, I heard all this commotion. There were these gasps and shocks and awes. Um, and so I, I ran over there to see what was going on. And literally, in front of my own eyes, I watched an instantaneous miracle as it happened. I saw, I saw God heal this woman. Now, I found out later she had been paralyzed for months with a stroke, uh, had been incapacitated, was unable to work. The people that lived there knew that. Small town Illinois, they knew that. They knew her. That church knew her. I didn't know uh, how significant this moment was, except for me. It was the first time in my life I had seen. I'd heard my grandpa tell me stories but it's the first time I had seen it with my own eyes. She got up and skipped across the front of the church. Monday night, the church was packed. Her husband was not a believer, did not go to church with her. He came to church with her Monday night. Their whole family responded to the invitation and he gave his life to Jesus. While we were in Illinois, we get a phone call. Some of our friends um, that are mentors in our life Larry and Judy Moore pastored Haley when she was a little girl. Pastor Larry did our wedding ceremony. They were, they were great pastors to us um, in our early years. And they were on the way to a church service. And uh, Judy was, they were in an 18-wheeler, hit their car. And they didn't think Judy was going to live. We were doing everything we could to get to the hospital in Little Rock to see Judy before she passed. And I'll just be honest with you. I had just come out of this moment where God broke through supernaturally. And in my heart, we had to get there to believe God to raise her up out of that bed. So I went in. They were only allowing one person at a time in ICU. Larry left so Haley and I could go in. They made an exception for the both of us to go in. We gathered around her bed. You have to understand how disheartening it was. She was barely hanging on, coming in and out of consciousness. She had tubes and wires all in her body. She was conscious when we were in the room. We walked in. It had been three days since the accident. I stood on one side of the bed. Haley stood on the other side of the bed. And I started talking to her. And I started telling her, Miss Judy, Haley and I have just come from an incredible moment where we've just seen God do some amazing things and our faith is high. We have come into this room to pray that God raises you up out of this bed. And she raised her hand up as if to stop me. Her cords and two ivies, they all went with her. And I'm gonna, what I'm about to tell you took her a long time to say. Haley leaned in to understand her. I leaned in to understand her. But I'm just going to tell you the summation of what she said to us in that moment. She said, I don't want you to pray for me. I thought, oh, she's gotten bitter because of what's happened. And then she's always had a sense of humor. And then her next statement was, Larry has prayer chains around the world praying for me 24 hours a day for the last three days. Don't you think God is sick of hearing my name? <laughs> she said, but nobody has praised him for me. I haven't had a chance to lift my hands and I cannot lift them on my own. So Haley, would you use your hands under that elbow? And Brian, would you put your hands under this elbow? And would you lift my hands for me? Don't pray for me, but help me praise. And she basically in that moment reenacted Daniel chapter 3 where she said, God, I know you're able to hear all these people. I know you're able to do what you promise in your word. I just want you to know that my faith in you is not dependent on whether or not you answer this prayer. Whether I walk out of this bed or I am soon to meet you face to face, I just want you to know I trust you. I love you for who you are and not what you do. I walked out of that room as the student, not the teacher. And God gave me the gift of seeing those two events so close together because he wanted to show me two incredible perspectives on the power of faith 
One is a faith that sees the miraculous. One is a faith that says, I will trust him in the face of suffering. And both perspectives are faith in the Bible. Horatio Spafford was born in North Troy, New York, October 20th, 1828. He was a young lawyer and established a very successful legal practice in Chicago. He became very successful and financially affluent, but his family never let it change them. They stayed engaged in ministries of compassion throughout the city of Chicago. He had an incredibly close relationship with some of the great preachers and evangelists of that day, D.L. Moody, Philip Bliss, and other well-known communicators of that day. A biography describes Spafford this way, quote, a man of unusual intelligence and refinement, deeply spiritual and devoted student of the scriptures. He was a man known to have a deep, intimate relationship with God. But a string of heartbreaking tragedy started to unfold in his life when he was 43 years old. October the 9th, 1871, the Great Fire of Chicago started. And according to legend, Miss O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern in a barn, started a fire. 16 hours later, three and a half square miles of Chicago had burned to the ground. And with it, all of Spafford's real estate holdings were wiped out by the disaster. The Spaffords had a consistent history of serving God, acting on their faith, loving people. And immediately after the fire of Chicago, they devoted countless dollars and countless hours to helping other survivors of the fire. In November of 1873, about two years later, Horatio Spafford, just trying to get away after spending two years trying to rebuild his life, wanted to go to Europe with his family to hear D.L. Moody in one of his powerful revivals in Great Britain. A winner had settled into Chicago, a tough winner. Horatio and his wife Anna, their four daughters, 11-year-old Anna, Annie, nine-year-old Maggie, seven-year-old Bessie, and two-year-old Tanetta, started to anticipate the trip like you would if you were going on an incredible vacation. When it came time for the trip, Spafford's business encountered some difficulties and he had to stay back at home. But he didn't want to deprive his family of this trip they had been anticipating. So he took his girls to the dock, kissed his wife and his daughters goodbye, put them on the boat and promised to join them as soon as he could. The Spafford women boarded a French steamer for a transatlantic journey. Off the coast of Newfoundland, tragedy struck. It was November the 22nd. The French ship collided with an English ship. It ripped a gaping hole in the ship's hull. The French ship, the Via de Hoeuvre, plunged to the bottom of the frigid sea within 12 minutes. In the moments before the ship sank, Anna gathered her four young girls by her side and prayed over them holding the youngest, the two-year-old, Tanetta, in her arms. As the waters of the icy North Atlantic swept over the decks of the ship, the three older children were swept away. Eventually, the baby was washed, Tanetta, from her mother's arms. Anna was clinging to a piece of floating wreckage. She was alone and almost dead when a lifeboat spotted her, pulled her out of the frigid sea. She was among only 47 people who survived that wreck. 226 people lost their lives that day. Four of them were Horatio Spafford's daughters. It was 10 days before those that were rescued, the survivors, landed safely in Cardiff, Wells. From there, Anna Spafford sent a telegram to her anxious husband. It was a brief, distressing message that simply said, Saved alone. Boarding the next available ship out of New York, Horatio set sail for Cardiff Wells, where he would be reunited with his grieving wife. In the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the ship's captain called Spafford to the bridge and said this, to the best of my calculations, Mr. Spafford, this is where the tragedy occurred and your daughters drowned. Horatio Spafford stood on the bridge of that ship contemplating the loss of his girls. And they say he stood there for a long time and then immediately returned to his cabin where he wrote a poem in that cabin at about the place his daughters drowned, a poem that has become a famous hymn. And it begins this way, when peace like a river 
attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's the flip side of faith. It's but even if he doesn't kind of faith. It's a faith that perseveres in the face of suffering. Because it's filled with a hope that transcends this world. It's the same kind of hope the people at the end of Hebrews 11 possessed in their suffering. Remember what it said about them? They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Which is why Spafford went on to write this fourth verse. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so It is well with my soul. This is the reason Daniel 3.18 has become one of the guiding verses of my life. It gives my faith perspective when it feels like God is answering my prayer with no or wait. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. Here's what I want us to do at all of our campuses. We're gonna sing this song together as an act of faith. And we're gonna sing this song, the first verse of this song together. Saxy, our team here is gonna lead it. And we're all gonna sing the first verse together. When we get to the chorus, we're gonna go live at every campus and your teams are gonna take over there. So would you stand with me all over this place today? And I want you to sing a declaration of trust and faith in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But even if he doesn't, it is well with my soul.
team, would you come and make yourself available to serve this body today? I don't know if you find yourself in the first 35 verses of Hebrews 11 or you find yourself in the last few verses of Hebrews 11, but there is a faith that can sustain you in either situation. And if you need us to join with you, our faith with yours, we are happy, honored to stand with you and believe for God to be at work in your suffering for the miraculous. We're going to keep knocking. We're going to keep believing. We're going to keep asking. And we're going to keep trusting. So, Father, will you bless them and keep them? Would you make your face shine down upon them? Would you be gracious to them? Turn your countenance their direction, Lord. I hope they understand. Your countenance is your face. We don't just want your hand. We don't just want your handouts. We're not just interested in what you can do. We want to see your face. We want you to turn your countenance our direction. We want to know you. And we want you to give us peace today. In the matchless name of Jesus, amen and amen.